Well, hey, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be, folks. Uh, welcome to Takeo Tuesdays. Uh, I'm John Barba. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to my right is Dave Holdorf, and to my left is Patrick S. Dave Holdorf, of course, is uh, Takeo's Eastern Regional Training Manager. Uh, I'm Takeo's uh, Director of, Man of Training. And Patrick S. comes to us from uh, Mondale and Associates, our manufacturers, uh, Takeo's manufacturers rep in Minnesota, North and South Dakota. Um, Parts unknown as well. I'm sure you've got you you cover those unknown states out there in the Midwest. Um, Western Wisconsin as well. Western Wisconsin as well. There you go. And one of it, this is going to be an interesting program because we're not going to really talk about a Takeo product today. What we're going to talk about is something we don't sell, but 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 we feel is very very important to the whole residential hydronics business and by extension the commercial hydronics business, and that is the the issue of water treatment and boiler water boiler water care boiler water quality what can what is good boiler water what is bad boiler water how do you tell the difference how do you turn bad boiler water into good boiler water and how can you tell if you have a boiler water problem uh, that's a lot to pack into an hour and fortunately patrick is, is he he is the best presenter personally i've ever seen and i'm not blowing smoke up your skirt patrick the best presenter on this topic I've ever seen. If it, He knows it backwards, forwards, and he can explain it in a way that really makes it understandable and impactful. So I'm really excited for you guys to 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 get a gander at at uh, at, at Patrick's presentation. So he, you, you can really learn firsthand the, the, the true critical importance of all this. Now, a couple things before we get started. <clears throat> Just some helpful webinar tips that we've learned since we started doing these things gosh uh well we've been doing webinars since 2010 at Taco, but really put it into overdrive starting at the beginning of quarantine in the end of march there's a lot of things we've learned that that are going to help you guys make the most out of this the first treat it like a classroom experience if you have your phone next to your computer just turn the phone face down because it's real tempting to check email or texts or facebook or stuff like that Try to avoid that. Pretend we're in a classroom together, okay? And we're all face to face. So, so uh, consider this like that. Don't don't be distracted. I know it's hard, but please don't be distracted. You get the most the most out of this program if you follow these tips. So first, treat it like a classroom experience. Secondly, take notes. Get yourself a pad of paper and a pen and take notes during the program. Yes, we're recording this session. Yes, you will get a, a link tomorrow to a copy of the recording, and the, and we'll also archive uh, a recording on our website for you. Uh, but take notes anyway. It's a powerful tool to help you pay attention, and taking notes during class actually does wonders for your retention rate. Uh, you, you'll really start to remember more, and it'll keep you more engaged. It's not going to be a distraction. What it's going to do is it's going to help you stay focused. So highly recommend taking notes, writing stuff down. <clears throat> and lastly, ask questions. All right, it, 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 this is these things can be kind of one way, and we want to make them two ways as much as possible. So ask questions as they occur to you. And what we'll do is every couple three slides, we'll take a quick, you know, pause for the cause and see where we're at with questions and answer the questions that you have as you come up. And we'll stay online as long as long after the presentation as you want to uh, answer whatever other questions that you may have. So this is this is a program for you guys and for your benefit. So please, please, please ask questions. Now, how do you ask questions? A lot of you folks have been with us before, but I wanna make sure you understand. On your control panel, you should see that little orange arrow, okay? If it's pointing to the left, click on it. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna expand uh, the, the, the control panel. And at the bottom of the control panel, there's a spot for you to ask your question. So what I want you to do is make sure you, you oops, excuse me, you utilize that to ask a question. What I'd like you to do right now is if you could just uh, uh, type in a hi, hello, how are you? Uh, okay, yep, very good. Laser beams, yep, Joe Finale. Okay, we got a few there. Carrie asked, uh, am I the only one who's losing uh, um, audio? Sometimes if you log out and log back in, um, you might uh, you it might help you, Carrie. Uh, it depends on. Our internet, sometimes it's on our end, sometimes it's on your end, and the internet connection, it really depends. So uh, if you if you, if it continues, log out, log back in, and, and hopefully that'll take care of it for you, Carrie. So again, folks, as we go along, every any and any questions that you have, um, please type them in, and again, we'll be we'll be happy to take care of them. And thank you all for for chiming in. What I would like to do right now then is to turn this over 
to Patrick. Uh, I'm going to make you the organizer now, Patrick. And if you want to share your screen and take it over, remember, Pat, uh, Patrick will be taking you through soup to nuts on water treatment and water quality. And again, as your questions pop up, please ask them. And both Dave Holdorf and I will be monitoring and we will uh, be making sure that you have your questions answered. All right, take it away, Patrick. Okay. So let me go back here. Whoop. What are we doing? From the start. All right. Uh, thank you, John. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this presentation. Let me hit that. So we're going to start with boiler water treatment and some of the reasons of why we want to look at boiler water treatment. Um, as John said, as we go through, please feel free to ask questions, raise your hand. John will notify me as we do have questions and we can stop and hopefully address them and, and give you the answers that uh, you, you need. Um, you'll find that in, in a lot of cases uh, during presentations, when you're when you're receiving a presentation from from a presenter, um, there's two different there's two types of presenters. There's presenters that are going to tell you what you want to hear, and there's presenters that are going to tell you what you need to hear. Uh, this is more so about things that you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. Um, I found that with boiler water treatment, a lot of times uh, people don't really want to hear the answers, uh, but in fact, they are actually the solutions to the problem. So um, just know that when, when we're talking about boiler water treatment and some of the things we should be doing and, and need to do, uh, it's, it's not something that uh, that's just there for practice. It's there for real reasons. There's real problems out there, and we're going to address some of those. So um, some of the benefits of water treatment. Well, we can improve and maintain system efficiency, prevent system breakdown, reduce fuel costs, uh, minimize environmental impact, reduce callbacks. And then the last one, uh, to me, is the one that really has some meat to it, and it's, it's comply with manufacturers' recommendations and requirements. Um, Throughout the years, I've met many, many, many contractors, and there's a lot of different uh, types of contractors, and there's a lot of different ways to do this business. And some people may not be uh, be concerned with maintaining system efficiency. They're not paying the bill. There's other contractors that aren't worried about breakdowns. They don't do service work. Uh, there's contractors that aren't reduced, uh, aren't concerned about uh, reduced fuel costs. They're not worried about that at all. Uh, they put the system in and they move on. Um, environmental impact, there's people that just don't buy into it, they're not believing it, they think it's a pink unicorn. And then uh, last but not least, reduce callbacks, right? Well, there's a lot of contractors that turn their phone off at four o'clock, they're at happy hour. Um, you know, there, it, it, whether I agree with it or not, the reality is people are gonna do the business the way they wanna do business. So there's things that can affect you, there's things that won't, but no matter what type of contractor you are, I think the bottom one, is big and it affects every one of us. And it's complying with manufacturers' recommendations and requirements. Now understand that every boiler that I'm aware of has a pH requirement in the boiler water and typically it's between six and a half and eight and a half. And you wanna be within that range. If you're not within that range, um, you can get corrosion in the boiler water system. Um, you can see on the slide here, there's a picture of boiler water. There's a picture of black boiler water and clear boiler water. And I will tell you that Boiler water is not supposed to look like this. Even though back when I was a young man, I got into the field, I had some senior installers that taught me that, yeah, that's what boiler water looks like. See, that's just that's just dead water. That's water with the oxygen removed out of it. Uh, some guys actually taught me that this is a really good heat sink. It really carries BTUs well. Um, I'm here to tell you today what I know in 2020 is all of that is false information. And that's just all stuff that they were taught. They weren't liars. They just didn't know that's what they were taught. The reality is we want boiler water to maintain in a state of clarity, okay? We don't want all the pieces and parts from corrosion in this water. Uh, what's making this boiler water black is actually products from corrosion. And corrosion is due to typically a higher or low pH. pH, remember with pH, the scale of pH is seven to seven and a half is neutral. When I get lower than seven and a half, I'm running acidity. When I get higher than seven and a half, I'm I'm at a state of, of alkalinity, neither of which are good for a boiler water or a, a boiler system. So the bottom one, complying with manufacturer's recommendations and requirements is very important. You want to make sure that your boiler water is in that seven to seven and a half range or or in between six and a half and eight and a half for majority of your boiler uh, manufacturers that are out there. Um, because there's a term out there that's that's more commonly known today than it ever was, and it's called credit upon evaluation. When we have a boiler failure, and, and the failure is a heat exchanger on a boiler, 
Uh, majority, if not all the manufacturers today, want that heat exchanger back. They want to take a look at it and they want to ensure that it wasn't due to poor boiler water quality. They want to ensure that if they're going to warranty that it was a, a defect in the manufacturing, that there was actually a problem with that heat exchanger and it didn't fail because we're running this through it. Because we know today that this is an absolute death sentence for boilers, specifically high efficient boilers. Okay, so what are the problems? The problems, problems are corrosion and a lot of times lime scale buildup in these systems. Remember with corrosion, all mixed metal systems corrode, ferrous metals corrode to form sludge. General and localized corrosion can happen. Localized pitting corrosion can be very rapid in some systems. And uh, black magnetite and red iron rust are typical in those systems from corrosion, okay? The black particles in this water have a tendency to attach to the hottest point in the boiler. And for those of you that are out there thinking about it, where is the hottest point in the boiler? Well, the hottest point in the boiler is actually the heat exchanger. And we've got some pictures here that do a really nice job of displaying and showing what we're talking about. This is actually a great picture of a fire tube heat exchanger. And if guys are familiar with the fire tube heat exchanger, that's known in the industry as the heat exchanger that doesn't require any maintenance. And I always find that somewhat amusing because Every condensing boiler on the market requires annual maintenance. Every condensing boiler on the market has one thing in common, I guarantee you they have, and that's a condensate trap. Okay, we have to trap that condensate. And if the condensate trap isn't cleaned and maintained annually, that condensate trap can actually build up and start to short cycle the boiler. So for people out there that are looking at condensing boilers and trying to find one that doesn't require maintenance, I'm gonna wish you the best of luck because I, I, as, as far as everything that I know of, condensing boilers require annual maintenance at a minimum to clean a condensate trap. Now, my, my spiel today is on the water quality, and as you can see, this fire tube heat exchanger, where did all the contaminants build up? The camp contaminants built up at the hottest point in that heat exchanger, which is up at the top where the burner is burning down into that fire tube, okay? And you can see the buildup on this, and where do those fire tubes typically fail and, 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 and basically fall apart. It's up at the weld at the, at the top. And it's not because of a bad weld typically, it's because it's insulated from contaminants and buildup such as the, the picture shows here, and, and it's overheating. When we overheat a heat exchanger, what else are we doing? We're short cycling that boiler, okay? We start to go through igniters, venturis, uh, heat exchangers. We start to go through all of those, those uh, I guess, system uh, products that, that, that start ignition. Um, the worst we, thing we can do to a boiler is overheat it and short cycle it. Well, if I start to build up on the heat exchanger, that's exactly what I'm gonna do, okay? This is a great picture of a cutout of a Giannone heat exchanger. Giannone, largest heat exchanger manufacturer in the world today. And you can see that as that, that, that black water is going through that heat exchanger, notice where it starts to build up. It starts to build up right where the burner is supposed to hit the water. Well, a lot of people look at Gino and heat exchanger and say, well, now the problem is that I'm restricting flow through the heat exchanger and you are restricting flow. But to me, the more important issue is how the hell is my heat from the burner getting into the water? And you can see here, it's not getting into the water. So now we're gonna start tripping on high limit. But more importantly, where is that, if, it can, if the heat can't get into the water, where does that heat go? Well, it's gonna start to go out of the exhaust. If it can't get out of the exhaust, it's gonna start to overheat the heat exchanger, and in this situation, it actually burned a hole right through the back of the heat exchanger. Okay, remember, most of these condensing boilers, if not all of the condensing boilers, are, are vented in PVC. PVC has a heat limitation of about 150 degrees. Okay, if I can't get the heat into the water, as, as this is showing, that heat is gonna go out of the exhaust. If you've ever seen brown, black, cracked, sagging PVC, there's a very good chance that your heat exchanger is probably plugged up with contaminants such as this. So your repair to that would be a two-part fix. Number one, you've got to treat and clean that water up in the entire system. And number two, more importantly, you probably need to flush a heat exchanger cleaner through this heat exchanger. John, how are we doing with questions? We had one quick one on uh, how to test for pH, but I think you're going to be getting into that, correct? I absolutely will get in that towards the end on testing, but uh, you know, repetition is always good. To test for pH, uh, in most cases, you would use some test strips. 
Test strips have a lot of times different colors that you'd match up on a color selector to kind of closely match it. There are also some digital pH meters as well uh, that can test. So there's a variety of ways to test for pH. Uh, in most cases, people that I'm, I'm familiar with and the system I'm familiar with, we use test strips, pretty inexpensive way to test for pH. Um, but that's, in most cases, that's how we do it. So, um, so the, the back on track here. So how do we address water quality? If I have, you know, how do I keep my water constant and stable? How do I keep it from turning like this to staying like this? And you'll notice that these two samples I have are actually water from Eden Prairie, Minnesota. It's the same fittings, just this was treated, this one was not. And you can see that these samples are actually, um, if you can look at the date here, you can see they're from December 16th, 2011. Okay, we have untreated water and we have treated water. Okay, and the way we keep it that way is with protectors. Protectors can provide some long term protection against corrosion and scale. They're going to maintain design efficiency for the boiler. They can prevent pumps and actuators from sticking. They can prevent pump seals from failing. Um, they can reduce boiler noise, reduce maintenance costs, treat all mixed metal systems and aluminum too. So, you want to make sure when you're using protectors. Number one is that protector and the pH level where your boiler manufacturer wants it to be. Okay, there are some protectors out there that are actually out of range with where the boiler manufacturers want it to be. So you've got to look at that. And the other is know that the protector you're using can actually be used in aluminum, cast iron, stainless steel, whatever you're you're trying to, to inject that into. Um, one of the products that, that we represent is called Fernox. There's other ones out there. One of the benefits to me of Fernox is I can use it in all mixed metal systems, aluminum, cast iron, stainless steel, and it has a pH of seven to seven and a half. Uh, it actually will automatically uh, uh, get the pH, whether it's high or low, it brings it into seven, seven and a half, which is a pretty unique uh, thing for a protector to do. So you wanna make sure that you understand the fine print of the protectors that you're using, and you want to make sure that they actually fall in line with the boiler manufacturers. Some other things you want to look at with protectors are, are they non-toxic? Are they non-foamy? Um, what is the pH level of the protector being used? And then also, you always want to use a cleaner first in those systems. I've had people ask in the past of, you know, do I need to use a cleaner if it's a brand new system? And I'm a bit torn on it simply because of this. Um, I had one job where it was an infor job and they used press fittings on the entire job. And uh, the system was acting like it, it wasn't getting enough flow through it. I uh, went out and visited the job. We pulled the strainer on it. And lo and behold, we found the strainer was completely full of uh, pipe dope sealant. Uh, come to find out that the contractor was actually taking the nipple on the fitting, was actually dipping it down inside of uh, the pipe dope container. So. Um, something I would have never thought of. So I used to always say, you know, if it's, it's, it's a brand new system, do you really need to clean it or not? Um, after that experience, I would say you probably want to clean and flush all systems out there, whether they're new or, or replacement systems, just simply because uh, that would have saved that contractor probably about five visits in getting the rep involved had they just flushed it and cleaned it first. Uh, before they started it, even though it was brand new. So uh, you always want to make sure that you are using cleaners first. Okay. Identify the problem. If there's excessive buildup from sludge within the system, um, you know, cleaning a, a system can, 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 can prevent premature and component failure. Um, there's a cleaner out there from Fernox called F5. That's a cleaner that we represent. That's a cleaner that we use to clean systems up. Okay, that's a system cleaner that uh, we want to inject into the system, flush the system out, and then we would want to treat uh, with our, our protector, our inhibitor package. Here you can see with the inhibitor package that we represent, you can see how it protected that system and you can also see how quickly that system started to corrode just after eight weeks. So some of these systems, it really doesn't take long, even though they're still closed loop systems, the pH in that water that we're using is, is very critical. Okay, here you can see, this is my son, Jacob. Jacob is actually putting uh, some, some inhibitor into the system at my house. Um, my house I did in 2009, 2010, December, January, 2009, 2010. And after about five years, uh, my system actually developed a pinhole leak in the uh, expansion tank. Well, come to find out, I used a, uh, a glycol 
that that glycol had an inhibitor package in it that actually after four to five years breaks down and actually required someone to come out and recondition it. Well, that was something I learned the hard way. And uh, what I ended up doing was using the Fernox uh, inhibitor package to re-inhibit the glycol in my system. My system, it looked very clean. The water was, was still, uh, uh, the clarity of it was very good, but my pH was getting, actually my system, it was high, it was running alkalinity. Uh, so by putting the F1 in the system, uh, it helped reduce that. The reason I wanted this picture is many times I've had people ask, you know, well, how do you inject it into the system? Well, there's different ways, there's different products out there. The one I prefer and like is actually the Express Cans. With the Express Cans, and you'll notice this is actually a newer Express Can, uh, the one that's in the picture here that Jacob is injecting, treated up to 24 gallons, uh, excuse me, 26 gallons. The new cans now treat up to 34 gallons. So um, just a little bit different, different packaging. But you'll notice that you hook up to the boiler drain, you would take your connector and loosely connect it to your can, and then you would open the boiler drain up, let a little water pee out, tighten it down, pull the trigger back and you would actually pull pretty hard. It almost feels like you're gonna break it. You pull the trigger back and in 45 seconds, that chemical, the protector is actually injected into the system. Very simple, no pumps or anything needed to do that. Uh, you can see here, Jacob was kind of not happy about his picture being taken, but I said, here's the deal. Either if you're gonna help me, you're gonna let me take your picture, otherwise you don't get to help me. So he's fine, you let me take your picture. I kind of laugh when I see the picture. Um, but lo and behold, I've checked my system periodically over the years and it has stayed steady and constant at that actually 7.5 pH is where it was the last time I checked it, which was about a month ago. Um, so uh, the product is, is doing a fine job in my system. One of the benefits of the product is it actually holds stable and constant um, through more than likely it'll outlast the life of a boiler that you're injecting it in. Um, so it's, it's been a good product to offer. It also works with aluminum, cast iron, stainless steel. You can't put it in the wrong type system. Um, it works with propylene glycols out there as well, um, even though they actually manufacture a glycol, but it will also work in existing systems that are out there. My recommendation is if you get into a situation like I was in, where you find the pH is out of range and the system is clean and clear, go ahead and add the, add the protector to it. But if the system is cloudy or dirty at all, you, you got to bite the bullet, flush that system out, put a cleaner in it, get everything flushed out, and then go in and retreat that system with the F1. Okay. Using system cleaners for new installs or existing, we kind of talked about this a bit. My recommendation today is I would clean every system out there, whether it's new or old, simply because you never know what could be in there, uh, such as pipe dope or, or items from, from soldering and things like that. There's a lot of things that can be in a system. So you want to make sure we flush and clean them out, right? Why would I want to flush, a, flush and, and clean a system out? I was doing a training uh, years ago in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and I was talking about the Fernox product line. Uh, we're fortunate enough at Mondale, we represent two fine boiler lines. Anytime we do a boiler training, I always talk boiler water quality uh, because I firmly believe that if manufacturers, uh, some of my competitors had been talking boiler water quality years ago when they first introduced their products, they'd probably still be having a lot of success with those products because unfortunately they had failures and a lot of those failures probably weren't due to a bad product. They were due to bad boiler, boiler water quality. So we've realized that and, and recognized that. So when we talk about our boilers, the first thing we talk about is boiler water quality because we want to have success. So as I was showing this product and showing this to a contractor, I was talking about cleaning the system. And I said, you know, if you if you take your old car and you're going to trade it in and you're going to drive that new car off the lot, imagine before you drive this car off the lot, you get in the car and you're going to start it and the service manager comes out and says, hey, hold on, shut the car off if you can't start the car yet because I need to take all the old fluid out of your old car and I need to put it in the new car because the new car doesn't come with fluid. So your oil, your transmission fluid, your, 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 your brake fluid, your, your power steering fluid, um, you know, everything in that car, the antifreeze in that car, everything in that car has to, has to be, be filled up. So we take the fluid out of your old car and put it in the new car. And I asked the guy, I said, would you actually buy that car? If you knew that all the fluid from the old car is being put in the new car, would you buy the car? And more importantly, would the manufacturer warranty that car? And I think we all know the answer that the answer is no. Well, think about that for a minute. When I changed that old cast iron boiler out, 
that's been in that farmhouse or been in that city building for 40, 50 years. And I go and put that brand new condensing boiler and I put the new boiler in and I don't flush and clean that system out. That's precisely what I'm doing. I'm taking all of this garbage that I didn't flush and I didn't clean out and I'm putting it through the new system. And after explaining that to the gentleman, he said, yeah, I know, I, I get all that. He said, I still, I don't use cleaners. I said, well, what do you mean? You, why, why don't you use cleaners? He said, I flush and I've been doing this 30 years and I flush and clean every system out that I've installed. I said, well, it's fantastic. What are you using for a cleaner? He said, I don't use cleaner. He said, I run raw water in and when I get all this black garbage out and water starts coming out of the boiler drain, clean and clear, I know I've cleaned that system. I said, all right, I guess that's how I used to do it. So I understand that. But um, let me ask you a question. I've been doing boilers for 30 years, right? He said, yep. Yeah. I said, you ever get this black stuff on your hands? You know, you get it on your hands when you're doing a boiler change out. He said, yeah. I said, can you get it off? You go to running water with soap, running water, and you're scrubbing your hands. Can you get that black stuff off of your hands? He said, no, it stays on for about a week. I said, exactly. But somehow, miraculously, by running raw water through the inside of that pipe, it's cleaning all that stuff out. No running water, no soap, no scrubbing, none of that. That's cleaning that pipe out but I can't get it off my hands with soap, running water, and scrub. And he looked at me and he said, you got me. And I said, I'm not trying to get you, just trying to make you understand this isn't stuff that, that is, is just you know for practice. This is real world stuff. This is real world problems that I'm talking about that I'm trying to come up with a solution and a way to fix it. And I think he got it after that. I like these slides because they help contractors and even homeowners understand why we want to flush these flush and clean these systems out we wouldn't want to take the old fluid from that old boiler and put it in the brand new condensing boiler and expect that system to run at its optimum efficiency it's not fair to the product it's not fair to the consumer so how do we address these systems there's some cleaners that we can put in the cleaner that i use uh the instructions are uh you would put it in for no more than two to seven days. You'd let it run around in the system. If it's hot and the system is running, it's more, uh, I guess, aggressive as a cleaner, but it doesn't need to be operating, okay? But the cleaner that we put in, we wanna have in that system, we would flush all of that water out with the system, fill it up with new water, and then we would put our inhibitor or a glycol with our inhibitor package in that to keep that boiler constant and stable. Um, does, does it help efficiency? It absolutely helps efficiency. There was a single family home in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it had a Bedaris GV142 boiler in it. Actually had an aluminum heat exchanger. It was installed in 2007. Had 10 cast iron radiators in it, estimated from the 1920s, and two flat panel radiators. And by flushing that system out with the cleaner, they found that they increased the efficiency by 15%, okay? And I thought about that, and I used to kind of hide these slides because 15% didn't seem like that big of a deal to me. But in reality, if I change an 80% boiler out, I put a 95% condensing boiler in, what did I just gain? I gained 15%. How much does that cost? So you think about that, it's like, holy smokes, just by cleaning the system, I can get 15% efficiency. It's a lot less money. Now, we sell boilers. We make a living selling boilers. So I encourage you, please, when you find an old system that needs to be replaced, Replace it, but clean it as well. By cleaning a boiler system that looks like this with water that looks like this, you're gonna increase the efficiency of that system by upgrading to condensing by about 30%. If you've ever done a boiler inspection and you look at some of these 80% uh, efficient boilers that have been in for 30 years and they're operating at about 65% efficient, why do you think that is? The burners are clean, gas pressure's right, the unit's burning properly, but my, my flu gas is high. My efficiency isn't 80% anymore, it's lower. Why is that? Because we're running this through that system. Remember when we add glycol to water, we change the specific heat and specific gravity of the fluid. And by doing that, now to move uh, 100,000 BTUs, we can no longer with, with, with raw water at a 20 degree delta T, we would need 10 gallon a minute. Well, once we add glycol, because we change the specific heat and specific gravity, we now need to pump more GPMs to move the same amount of BTUs. Well, what do you think the specific heat, specific gravity of this fluid is? So I can assure you it's not one, all right? So now we've made that system less efficient. 
So by cleaning those systems up, we'll gain efficiency. When, when you're doing boiler change outs and you show a homeowner, look, we need to not only replace the system, but we're also gonna flush and clean it so that our system is within the warranty specs. And then also we're operating at its peak efficiency. You're gonna see about a 30% increase in efficiency. Now we have an opportunity to get a return on our investment. Got some good questions coming up here, Patrick. Uh, uh, two of them I think you already covered. One is, do you recommend a pH neutralizer and how do you adjust pH? Did your, 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 not your cleaner, but your protector basically will do that automatically. And there are others that will do that as well, right? There are. I will tell you my experience uh, back in the day, I was a service tech. I attended a training because I wanted to be the best guy. You know, I, I wanted to do a good job. So I got trained on how to check pH in a boiler system. So I was on a boiler system. I checked pH. And uh, this is a true story. Um, I, I, I'm like a lot of contractors out there. Uh, and, and I learned. Um, but here I was, checked the system out, found the pH was actually low, and I didn't know what to do then. In the seminar, they taught us how to test pH, but they didn't te teach us how to treat it. So I was on the phone with probably four or five different distributors in the Twin Cities market, finally got a hold of an older gentleman that knew what to do. He said, well, you're going to need to add inhibitor to raise the pH because you want to be in a state of neutral. So come on in and grab some inhibitor. He asked me about how many gallons I had, and I told him, so he had some there. And when I showed up, he had inhibitor, but he also had neutralizer. And remember, this was an $85 boiler tune-up at the time. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, well, what? what I, I thought you said I needed to add inhibitor. He said, well, you do, but he goes, you'll overdose. It. So what you do is you put the inhibitor in, you come back the next day, and you'll probably have to put some neutralizer in. And typically by the third day, he goes, you'll have it balanced out right where you need it. Well, how the hell was I going to build and charge for that? So I can tell you, I got that boiler up and running and everything was, was neutral. And I got the pH to a state of neutral. But I can also tell you that was the last boiler I ever checked pH on. Because I thought there's no way that I can turn a boiler tune up into a three-day deal, go back and do all this stuff. So I didn't talk about checking pH on boiler for years. Okay. Well, all of a sudden, the Fernox product I represent, and there's some others out there, as you pointed out, that can do the same thing from my understanding. But I know Fernox can actually automatically neutralize the pH. So as I learned about it, I said, well, wait a minute. So if my pH is high or low, it automatically brings it to a seven, seven and a half. And they said, yeah. I said, all right, but I can, what, what happens if I overdose it? And they said, no, that's the cool part. You can't overdose with this product. At that point, I absolutely fell in love with this product because as contractors know, if, if, if it works and it's effective and it's easy, we'll do it. But if it works and it's effective and it makes my life miserable, guess what? I'm probably not going to do it. That's right. just the reality of, of human beings and, and the way we are. So that's one of the benefits of the product that we represent is it, it really simplifies water treatment on boilers. So I, hopefully that kind of answers the question of, of how to test uh, and, and how to treat boiler water. Um, there are okay. products out there such as the one we represent that really makes it simple. There's other products out there that are, are quite painful to work with. Uh, pick your poison. I, I know I picked the easier way and the more effective way for me to, to treat it. Uh, any other questions, John? Oh, so, uh, quite a few more. Actually, here's one. What's the maximum TDS you should have, total dissolved solids? Uh, you know, that depends on the manufacturers. Um, there are actually some publications uh, that, uh, you know, I look at with Boilers, I'm not as concerned about it because most of the inhibitors, like the inhibitor package in ours, will actually take uh, a hardness in the water and it'll actually kind of buffer it out so it can't separate out and plaque up the system. Um, a lot of your inhibitor packages will neutralize the TDSs, um, but there are actually some pumps out there. One in particular I know of that has a limitation of, of 500, which is extremely low. Um, so you kind of want, in my opinion, I'd look more at the pumps than I would the boilers out there and what they're looking for for total dissolved solids. Um, I, like I said, there was one one pump in particular that I knew of that was looking for like 500. That one, we definitely were putting uh, the uh, the Fernox F1 water treatment in because it takes right. that and buffers that out. And we're not talking about Taco pumps either. We can handle that stuff. <laughs> right. Um, right. Do you use a chemical or mechanical cleaner? I think you covered that one, the, mechan the, the chemical cleaner. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, chemical cleaner that we represent is a, it's actually F3 now. Um, and that cleaner has, it has an ability to hold 
the stuff it's cleaning into solution for about seven days so that you can flush it all out. Um, if you leave it in too long, number one, it's, it's an acidic cleaner, so you don't want to leave that in too long. But number two, more importantly, it loses its ability to hold those particles in suspension to be flushed out. They'll start to fall out. Now, there's other products. We represent one as well that if you have a system that you can't adequately clean or flush, you can put it in and it's a cleaner and a protector all in one packet. But remember, when we're using products like that, we need to put some type of filtration, whether it's a strainer or magnetic filtration, but something that we can service and maintain to remove the contaminants that it's, that it's continually cleaning. Uh, there's a reason there's a rinse cycle on your dishwasher and clothes washer. You want to get rid of the stuff that is cleaning. So. All right. Very good. Here's a two-parter from Benjamin Hicken. Uh, does Fernox break down over a period of time being heated and cooled, pumped, et cetera? And then the follow-up to that is, could deionized or distilled water be used instead of Fernox in the entire system fill? Okay, uh, it's a good question. So the Fernox inhibitor package um, does not break down over time. It could be diluted, but it doesn't break down over time. It's been in testing for you know, over 50 years right now, and it's 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 stable and constant. It's still holding. Now that said, I always tell people typically. Uh, the inhibitor package I sell should be, every hidden inhibitor package should be checked once a year. Generally speaking, my inhibitor package should outlast the life of a boiler. Flat out, piece of cake, it's not going to break down. Other inhibitor packages out there, phosphorus, phosphate, uh, nitrate, nitrite bearing inhibitor packages have a life expectancy and they will break down. So you need to, when you're using glycol specifically, you've got to look at the frying print. Now, DI water is an exceptional product to use. Um, but, you know, even DI water, if we mix other fill waters in with DI water, we could start to have some breakdown. Now, there's some glycols out there that require DI water. The benefit of the glycol that we represent through Fernox is it can be used with up to 70 grain hardness, 60 parts per million red iron rust. You can use DI or soft water. It doesn't really matter. Um, and, and the other thing is don't think that DI water is your get out of jail free card. Okay. Remember, if I'm using DI water with other glycol manufacturers and those inhibitors in those manufacturers end up breaking down, doesn't matter if I've got DI water or holy water, we're <laughs> going to have a problem when that inhibitor breaks down. So a lot of people that had, there's a misconception of, well, I use DI water with the glycol, so I'm good. Well, it depends on the glycol you're using in the inhibitor package in that glycol. So I, I hope I address that question. It, it's a very good question commonly seen where I'll get guys that'll go, well, I don't have to worry about glycol because I'm using DI water. And a lot of times those systems with, with certain, a lot of our competitors' glycols, those systems end up having a high iron content due to corrosion. Um, I'm running into a lot of those systems right now in colleges. Oh, very good. Some more questions. Uh, should you heat the water up to a certain temperature in your system when running the cleaner? I think you um, would it, talk uh, about that a little bit. Yeah, the, the system cleaner that we represent and sell is more aggressive if the water's heated, so it's going to do a better job of cleaning, but it's not required. It, it doesn't need to be um, done that way. Uh, there's other cleaners out there that probably do need it to be heated up. The cleaner that we represent doesn't. Uh, it does make it more aggressive, but it's not required. It, they don't need to do that. Okay, very good. Is it true these inhibitors have a limited life and that after years in the system, effectiveness drops off and will require retreating? I think you, you, you touched on that, but I guess this is a follow-up. No, hey, yeah, it, it absolutely depends on the manufacturer and, and what they're using for their inhibitor package. Fortunately for us, um, that's not true. We, we want our inhibitors checked annually, just like everybody else, but the requirement of treating isn't there. Um, typically our inhibitor, unless it's diluted with more water and it's rinsed down, our inhibitor package should say stay constant ours. The other thing that, that is really important to know about glycols and inhibitors is um, low temperature systems, geo systems, systems that can't get above 140 degrees. Um, a lot of times, some of the inhibitor packages in those glycols that are out there actually um, promote bacterial growth. They act as food or fertilize the bacteria and help it grow. So when you're looking at glycols, you want to look at the inhibitor packages in those glycols as well, because some of them actually will promote that bacterial growth. And then the water gets all slimy, right? It actually gets like a snot. You can see almost like a white snot in some of those systems. And the only way to kill that bacteria um, that's effective is 
to either flush it out, uh, put a cleaner in, flush it all out, and start over with a different type of inhibitor package, or if you can spike that temperature above 140 degrees, which with most geo systems out there is virtually impossible. That, that ew, is all I have to say about that, ew. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, this gives great questions. Any EPA requirements with disposal of wasted water? And that'll be the last one for this round, then you can jump back into your presentation. Okay. Um, you know, it depends on the manufacturer. The benefit of the, the product that we represent is, it is environmentally friendly. We can be flushed down uh, drains and, and whatnot, and it, it's, it's acceptable. So when you're looking at different products that are out there, you want to ensure that, you know, the product you're working with there's a lot of stuff in the fine print. Um, one thing I learned on glycol, just, just to really share on that about how important this is, just in December, it was December 30th of 2019, all the trainings I've done, all the research I've done on everything, I found that probably one of the more commonly used glycols on the market today actually has a pH, uh, physical property pH of nine to nine and a half. It's not even within range of the boiler manufacturers. And I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. So the point of telling you that is to really make you recognize and realize the importance of understanding the product you use. The benefit of the product that I represent is I've always told people, if you're not looking at water quality and you're just mixing it with water on site and you're not going back and rechecking systems like you're supposed to, if you're using my competitors, you're probably doing it wrong. If you're using my stuff, you're probably doing it right and you're okay. So it's made it, again, if it's simple and it works, guys will do it uh, so it's, it's one of the benefits we have very good continue on my friend uh u.s water hardness map i love this map because it shows my good friends in chicago that actually lake michigan water is not the best stuff on the planet for boilers you can see it is extremely hard all right um i didn't make this map this is a u.s water hardness map that's available uh you can get, get it online uh, but here you can see this map that's showing extremely hard water in that Great Lakes area region. So the problem with hard water is there's 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 total dissolved solids and there's there's calcium deposits, there's different things in that hard water that will plaque up a heat exchanger. So you wanna make sure that we're using an inhibitor package that will actually help buffer out some of that hardness. One of the benefits of our inhibitor package that's out there, one of the things it can do. And it can prevent those boilers from getting plugged up and prevent them from short cycling and tea kettling and all the different things that we can get uh, from water hardness in those systems. Lime scale buildup, calcium carbonate deposits by the heating and hard water. They're going to reduce boiler heat transfer. They're going to cause higher fuel bills. Uh, you can get blocked valves from this situation. And the bigger thing is that whole tea kettling thing. So how do we address those systems if the heat exchanger does get plugged up? Well, there are different heat exchanger cleaners. There's one for a burner side, okay, that can actually break the burner down. When we're flushing and cleaning out the burner side of a heat exchanger, we wanna use a burner side cleaner. There's a product that we represent called DS, that's Dog Sam DS10. It's a burner side cleaner, and that helps break down these heat exchangers. Remember when we're servicing a Giannone style heat exchanger, such as what's shown today, we don't want to use high acid cleaners that are going to strip the metal. We don't want to use metal or wire brushes that are going to damage the metal. We don't want to damage our heat exchanger. We want to use an aggressive enough cleaner to break down the buildup on that so that it can drain out, but we don't want to damage the metal. So make sure when you're using burner side cleaners that you're using a cleaner that's approved by the manufacturer. And then last but not least, make sure you're using a nylon brush. Uh, nylon brush and in this case, uh, one of my favorite lines from another instructor is make sure that in between each one of these tubes, you use your wife's credit card to clean that out. Make sure you wear it out so that it no longer works and is effective. Um, I always thought that was kind of cute. But the reality is you want to clean a heat exchanger out with a, with a burner side cleaner. When we're cleaning the water, uh, this is a fire tube heat exchanger just showing that even fire tube heat exchangers require cleaning on the burner side. How would we know if a burner side needs to be cleaned? Um, you'd see uh, poor ignition qualities. You're gonna see high CO in the exhaust. You're gonna see issues. A lot of times if you see a plugged up heat exchanger such as these two pictures, you're gonna realize that something's wrong with your combustion, either you're researching flue gas or your gas combustion, your gas setup is it hasn't been done properly with a combustion analyzer or a dual input manometer. So when you're seeing a really fouled up heat exchanger on the burner side, you can ensure that uh, one of those two things has happened, or last but not least, 
the condensate may be building up in that because nobody's been cleaning the condensate trap out. Again, water building up in that is going to uh, cause a in, inadequate combustion on those systems and can certainly dirty up the heat exchange. With the water quality side, before I jump into glycol, understand that there is a, a heat exchanger cleaner for the water side available from Fernox that's called DS40. It's a powder-based cleaner. Um, it comes in a jug like this, and you mix it up. And when you mix it up, you take a cup of this powder to a five-gallon bucket, and it's pink like this. As long as it's pink, it's actually acidic, and, it, and, and, and it's, it's aggressive enough to clean the system. This is what we would use on a heat exchanger, not the heating system. Understand, we would need to isolate the boiler heat exchanger and flush it out with this. When would I want to do that? Well, with a boiler, a telltale sign of a plugged heat exchanger on a boiler is high exhaust temperature. If my exhaust temperature is getting up and, and, and climbing up there, I know that I'm no longer absorbing the BTUs into the water and it's going out of my exhaust. So typically that's a telltale sign of, hey, I must have a dirty heat exchanger. I need to flush and clean the system out. The DS40 is an excellent heat exchanger cleaner. It is a citric-based acidic cleaner, so you can get it on your hands. You're not going to shed skin. It's not going to damage the metal of the heat exchanger, but it's still aggressive enough to do a really good job cleaning. I've been selling this product now for about nine years, and it's been an exceptional product. Uh, it does a really fine job on heat exchangers. Just remember, it's for heat exchangers only, but aluminum, cast iron, uh, stainless steel, uh, bronze, copper, plate and frame, shell and tube, you name it, the type of heat exchanger, uh, indirect storage tanks, all that stuff, this product can be used on. And remember, this is a citric-based acidic cleaner. So um, we could use it on on on-demand on water heaters, things like that. We just want to make sure that just like any cleaner, you want to flush it all out before we go ahead and put that system back online, okay? So, John, any questions before we jump into glycol? Yeah, a couple of real quick ones here. Um, but do we need to flush the system before putting the inhibitor in? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I, like I said, now it's it's a kind of a two part question because if the system looks clean and it, and the fluid looks clean and clear yet, and damage like this hasn't been done yet, could you put the inhibitor in to get that pH back to neutral? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a little bit of a judgment. But if the system is cloudy or dirty at all. Then we'd want to put the cleaner in, let it run around in there, flush everything out, and then fill it with fresh water, and then add the inhibitor. Uh, the other thing I want to mention on filling it with fresh water, there's a lot of people that, because of the products they use, they have a limit of how hard the water can be. So they're actually adding with soft water. Understand that if I'm adding with soft water, I'm adding sodium and potassium to that system. And by doing that, that kind of promotes foam in the system. If you've ever seen a foamed up system, the system is foamy. Uh, that's due to, to high sodium and potassium content, probably because it was filled with soft water. Um, so you again, you wanna look at your glycol and the product you're using and you wanna you know, ensure that it's gonna work with the water you're filling it with. You wanna make sure that you're following their limitations and their instructions. All righty, very good. Uh, a couple comments from Steve Whelan from NTI. Flu temperatures exceeding 30 degrees of the supply water temperature means the boiler probably needs to be cleaned as a, as a, as a general rule of thumb. Um, and uh, this, another question, how well does the DS40 work on tankless coils in boilers? Uh, it, 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 old, old, old oil boilers would have a tankless coil to make domestic hot water. Um, it was just a coil inside the sections. Uh, how well does it work on cleaning those out, and how often should this be done? Uh, it works. I, I will tell you right now, it works very well. Um, just remember, you've got to, you know, some of those tanks, you know, some of them could be 40 gallons. So you may end up using a whole package of this to treat and clean 40 gallons because, you know, I take five gallons in, or one cup into a five gallon bucket. Well, now all of a sudden I take that five gallon bucket and dilute it down with 40 gallons of water sitting there. I'm, I'm not going to have enough cleaner. So when you're doing indirect storage change, just understand that you, you've got to understand how many gallons we're trying to treat and how much product I'm actually going to need. But I will tell you, in all honesty, I've gotten tremendous feedback on the on the heat exchanger cleaner and how well of a job it does. A lot of manufacturers out there recommend uh, a vinegar. Well, remember, they're talking about a commercial grade concentrate vinegar. Um, and even that, in my opinion, 
the, the heat exchanger cleaner we have is just a far better process and solution to try and clean out a heat exchanger. Very good. Without very managing good. It. And uh, Mike Lampkin had a question. I think Dave answered it, uh, but I want to share with everybody else. Does the bio barrier in the Taco ECM circulator get clogged up with bad water? Uh, the answer there is no, because it's not a it's not a filter. It's a it's a it's a brass barrier that all it really does is it makes the electronic motor the the mag the magnets on the motor side of the system basically invisible to any magnetic crud that happens to be in the water. So it's not a filter, there's not a constant exchange of fluids. It simply makes the magnets invisible to the water. The water goes zipping through that the volute. It does it 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 see it sees a barrier, a brass barrier, and it doesn't have any idea what's on the other side because it can't feel the magnet. It says because brass is not magnetic, of course. So it, it it's not a filter, there's not a constant exchange of fluids, so it doesn't need to be serviced or anything like that. That is one of the, in my opinion, and in all honesty, that is one of the better engineered products and ideas that have been, that have been in, in, installed in pumps in my lifetime. That that bio barrier for preventing that black iron contaminants from, from preventing these to get in around that magnetic rotor is, is just an absolute amazing thing to have in the pumps. Um, and to your point, John, it doesn't it, do, it doesn't require maintenance. It's never going to plug up. All it allows is the water to get in or to, to get in around that, but it doesn't allow the black particles to get in. So it allows the fluid in, but but this black particle is just going to blow right by it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunately to this date, as many trainings as I've done, not everybody treats boiling water. So mm -hmm. you got insurance policy. All righty, continue. Okay, so with glycols, the things I've learned about at glycols, uh, back in the day, I used to think glycols are pretty much, you know, glycols, glycol. You want to treat the water, put glycol in it. Um, that is uh, absolutely false. It couldn't be further from the truth. But again, that's what I learned and knew when I was in the field. Um, the big thing with glycols you need to understand is, is it aluminum safe? What metal heat exchanger can it be used in? You know, am, am I putting the wrong glycol in the wrong boiler? If you've ever done that, you'll understand that is devastating to a heat exchanger. If you put the wrong glycol in aluminum heat exchanger, you'll destroy that boiler in no time. So you need to make sure that the glycol you're using is acceptable with the metal system you're working with. Again, one of the benefits of the glycol we represent, it's, it, it's workable and usable in all metal heat exchangers that are out there. The other thing you need to know is what is the pH of the glycol you're using at solution. I just told you some of these glycols out there have a pH of, of nine to nine and a half. Some of them require that once the pH gets down to around eight and a half, you actually have to inhab their inhibitor to raise it back up to that nine and nine and a half. Well, is that even in range with the boiler you're putting in? Those are things we need to start looking at and recognizing. Um, the other thing is how long does the inhibitor last? Does it need to be reconditioned? Those are things we've got to look at as well. And are we going back and reconditioning them? Are we following the instructions like we're supposed to? The other is in the glycol, what are the inhibitors made of? Do those inhibitors uh, promote bacterial growth in low temp systems or, or, or don't they? Those are another good things to know when we're doing geo systems or low temp systems. Um, and then the other thing is when we're weighing out, well, this glycol costs this much, this one costs this much, you know, are we comparing a concentrate to a premix? Okay, is that glycol premixed and we're comparing it to a concentrate? There's some glycols out there that are 70, 30 mix. There's some that are out there that are that are concentrate. So that means that if I'm trying to get freeze protection, I may need 10 pails of one, but I only need 70 of the other because I'm getting 30% more product. Make sure you're looking at your concentration levels. And then also, does the manufacturer offer uh, uh, an exact concentration rate? Meaning, are they saying, you know, well, it could be 60, 40, it might be 70, 30, depending on how it all kind of settles out in the tank before we send it out. Um, if you don't know that, how are you mixing these systems up? If, if you don't know if it's 70, 30 or 60, 40 or hell, even 80, 20, how do you know how much you need to get the freeze protection you're looking for? Remember that one of the worst things we can do to a hydronic system is over glycol. If we over glycol it, we've just made that system less efficient means now we need to pump more gallons a minute to move the same amount of BTUs. There's some boiler manufacturers out there that actually have a limit of the concentration level in boilers. Some of them are 30%, some of them are 50%. And if you over 
uh, glycol a system and, and you get too rich of a mixture, you can actually create a tremendous amount of, of noise and wear and tear in those systems. So you want to look at that. And last but not least, uh, you want to follow the instructions. The devil is really in the detail. Again, I just told you, I learned something about another product, trying to find something completely different out, but I learned something about a product um, that I, I, you know, I thought I knew everything about glycol, and I guess I learned I'm never going to know everything about glycol, but uh, make sure you're following the instructions with the product you're using. One of the benefits of the product we represent is it's very easy to, to, to use, and it works in many, many, many applications. Um, it's it's pretty forgiving product. I think what you're saying is it's what you learn after you know it all that really counts, right? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Go. I couldn't have put it better myself, John. That's perfect. There is that go. on Rick's the house? Uh, say what? Is that on the house? Can I use that? You be my guest. I stole it from my <laughs> old man, you know, so go right ahead. I'm sure he stole it from somebody too. Uh, Rick Sass asks, just to be clear, I don't need to use a protector if using deionized water without glycol. He wanted to be clear on that. Uh, I would still recommend using a protector. I would absolutely still recommend using a protector with DI water. Because it can't hurt. Well, number one, it can't hurt. Number two, is somebody going to add water to that system? Um, you know, in, in is oxygen going to be present in that system? One of the thing of, of protectors out there is they help neutralize pH, but they also coat systems and prevent corrosion. And then last but not least, if there if there is any hardness in the water, it's going to help buffer that out. And the problem is you could put a system in brand new, and this is something I'm running in right now, is these guys will put systems in, but they're not the ones going back to do the work. Somebody else is going in behind them doing work. Well, yeah. You can run into a world of trouble for the cost of inhibitor packages to put it in a boiler. It's a no brainer to me to get it in there, even if you are using DI water. Very good, very good. And uh, when, uh, Jeff House asked to confirm something about TDS. Did you say 500, T, uh, 500 TDS was uh, considered low? I believe 500 TDS is extremely low, yeah. Okay, very good. All right. Continue. Yeah. Okay, so last but not least, should we be using a water test kit? And my advice is absolutely. When you're going to do a service on a boiler, you're going to, to, to look at a boiler, you should be testing the water. Now, I always tell people, if I get something that looks like this, do I really need to waste a water test on this? You know, I think my old man would know this, this is not good. It can't be good for a system. So this is pretty easy to show homeowner, look, this is what's in your boiler. We need to flush and clean that system out before it does some real damage on the system. But what if the water looks like this? Could this water be bad? It most certainly could. And to do a water test shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes. So when you're there doing a boiler service or a boiler turn up, a tune up, or you're there doing a service call, you should absolutely look at the water. I always tell people from my experience, the worst thing I could do is work on a high efficient boiler, pull out the igniter, replace the igniter, replace the combustion gas valve blower motor because it's now bad and I get the thing to fire up and as soon as I get it to fire, what happens? I start to get short cycling. How come? Because it's got this in it and heat exchanger is plugged solid. So now I got a boiler that's probably been giving this homeowner problems for the last four to five years it's been installed. They probably got thousands of dollars into it already and now I just dumped another thousand dollars into it only to look at it and go, oh, hey, by the way, um, we're probably going to have to flush and clean this system out and it's not going to be cheap. Wouldn't it have been better to look at the home more right away, take a little bit of this water, put it in there, uh, get a little boiler water, put it in a cup and go, here's the deal. Number one, your boiler water needs to be flushed and cleaned out. It's probably what's causing all these other problems in the system. So I'm just going to tell you right out of the gate, first things first, plan on flushing and cleaning the system out. Now I'm going to dig into it and find out what else is wrong with it. And now you find all these other things that are wrong and you give them an estimate, what's the first thing you're gonna say? Well, how much is a new boiler? Okay, if you don't do that first and you do the repair, I guarantee you that homeowner's gonna look at you and say, well, if you'd have told me it was gonna cost that much, I'd have just told you to replace it. So hopefully that's a compelling reason as to why we, we should be testing water on these systems. When we're testing water on a boiler system, we wanna look at uh, you know, the pH, I'm gonna fly through this because we are running out a little bit of time. But we want to look at the pH level, okay? We also want to look at our inhibitor level, and we want to know the hardness in those boiler systems. To me, those are the big three that I want to check on those systems. There's other tests out there that can tell you, you know, copper, iron, 
Um, and then also chloride testing. To me, the big ones are inhibitor pH and, and hardness. Those are the ones I want to know. Uh, you can also get interpretation of results from that testing. Again, if, if your pH is, is between six to six and a half, you should be good. If you're out of that range, you're out of the boiler manufacturer's recommendation specs, and you probably need to treat and get that system in there and back in line. Uh, one of the benefits of our product is you put it in the system, it automatically puts it to that seven, seven and a half. If there's hardness in a system, you can start to get scaling and kettling and things like that. And then obviously with the inhibitor, you want to make sure that your inhibitor package is set up. The only Achilles heel that the product that I represent has is we do not have a steam product. And generally, most of the time, somebody asks that. So I do not have a product that, that addresses or treats steam. Um, but there are products on the market that do that. Questions? Very good. Hey, what's Ellie May and Granny doing up there? <laughs> that was our that was our take after dark. Uh, that you actually you did a really nice job cleaning this thing up and making it look good. But um, I think I got was I Jethro that day or was Dave? Dave I'm not Jethro. sure. I'm not sure. But if you you I, I if you want to be Jethro, you can. You've earned the right to be whoever you want to be. <laughs> Fantastic. It's good to know. All right. What a great performance and, and excellent information. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. And, and folks, I open it up to any more questions uh, for you out there. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, do, 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 sounds of many hands clapping. That's what you're hearing out there, according to Wheels. Um, Thank you. Uh, Ting, I, you, will have a, you will be getting a copy of this recording. Uh, uh, you'll be getting a link to the copy of this recording tomorrow. Everybody who, who, who attended, you'll be getting a, an email tomorrow. Uh, from us that will have a, a, a link to download your PDH certificate as well as um, a link to the recording that you, can, you wa that you can watch as many times as you want. And um, uh, again, this is one, of, again, we love doing these things because it's not our products that we're talking about, but it's products that are just so important to making sure you guys put in the very, very best systems that you can and, and do the very, very best job servicing existing equipment that you can. So, uh, Patrick, so so many thanks to you for for just a fantastic job. Really do appreciate Thank you. it. I, I appreciate the opportunity and everything that Taco and yourself have done for me over the years. It's been uh, uh, it's nice to to try and repay the favor. So, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk this product line. Um, in all honesty, boiler water quality is is if it's addressed, it it really can make working with hydronics fun. Uh, there's a lot of manufacturers out there that they're starting to provide with their systems magnetic filtration devices and filters right on the boiler. Why do you think that is? You know, it's it's, it's boiler water quality is the number one killing killer of, of, of a condensing boiler, hands down. Um, if we can fix that and address that, now you'll start to see, you know, condensing boilers last 15 to 20 years like they're supposed to. Um, if we're not addressing water, you know, you're going to get that six to eight years out of it, and you're going to be replacing it. Um, and I told one guy, I said, if you find yourself saying that I never put a condensing boiler in because they don't last, you maybe need to go have a conversation with yourself and ask yourself why you're not addressing water quality. So. I'm sorry, I just had to go grab something here because I want to show it to everybody. Um, if you want to, if you guys want to, um, in, if if you can out there, make your the uh, the um, actually Patrick, if you if you uh, close out your um, presentation then the screen will uh get a little bit bigger actually can, i'll take the actually i will take the con back that would probably help here we're sharing here we go then are making me again there we go all right um okay i just wanted to show you guys we talk about mag dirt separators this is the mag dirt separator from Takeo the 4900, okay, it's a it's a simple flow through device, uh, not fancy, but it's very, very effective. Um, it looks a lot like our 4900 air separator, uh, and it is, it's just upside down and a little bit different. Inside, we have, um, you can see them in there, uh, pole rings, just like in the 4900. Now, in, in the air separator, the, the pole rings are used as a co for the coalescence effect, where air molecules are going to glom onto these things and and then get bigger and bigger and go glug 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 up the up the vent. Here it's used as a collision medium where uh, water and all of the associated crud come through here. The crud bumps into the pole rings. It's a collision medium, and because the velocity slows, the crud goes down to the bottom, 
where it is held in place by a 13,000 Gauss magnet. That, my friends, right there is 13,000 Gauss. I don't care how you slice it, that's a crap ton of Gauss. What Gauss is, it's a magnetic field. It's not a pull strength. It's, a, it's, it's the strength of a magnetic field. And it's very, very, even though this is not what you'd call a powerful pull strength magnet, it's a high Gauss magnet. And all it does is it holds that crap in solution down here at the bottom. And then, whoops, put that in upside down. And then when you're ready to, 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 to blow this stuff out, you, you turn the pump off and then you simply either put a bucket under this or connect a hose to it, open it up, and you blast out all the magnetic crap and then you close it and you're back in business again. So it's a very simple and effective dirt mag magnetic dirt separator. Uh, it, it's not, it doesn't have that big powerful pull magnet, but it doesn't need one because of the because of the collision medium. It just it hits that stuff, goes straight down, and then you just blow it out. And the magnet is external instead of internal. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of a cool, a cool little device, very cool little device. And these things always go on the return side to protect the boiler, always on the return side of the system. All right, any questions? Collision medium, you like that, Rick? Yeah, it's collision medium, man, right there. <laughs> Very good, very good. All righty. So hopefully you guys got to see that. Uh, let me know if you, if you got to see that, because uh, that's our, I, it was on our webcam. I know uh, we had one guy could not see it. Two guys could not see it. It's on my webcam. Uh, do, 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 do. Hmm. Okay, let me know if you guys did see it, if you did. Some of you, I know some of you didn't, but did some of you did. Ah, okay. Can we uh, have a PDF of this device? Actually, if you go to our website, uh, takeocomfort.com, and just look up the 4900 Dirt Mag separator, you'll find it. You'll find it all right there. Very good. A bunch of you guys could see it, so that makes me feel better. All right, Scott Hallandrung, how are you? Good to have you here. <laughs> all righty, very good. Well, any more questions you guys have? And Mr. Holdorf, anything you'd like to add? Uh no, I just, every time I listen to Patrick, I learn something more about water quality. So thank you, man. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> I should pay, I should pay attention more often. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, very good. Very good. All right, gang. Hey, well, again, thank you so much. We do appreciate the gift of your time. Uh, and uh, hope you had, I hope this was, this was useful for you. It was, it's always great. It was a good learning experience for me as well. I learn every time Patrick talks as well. So uh, we do appreciate Patrick. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for being with us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Yep.